Hello and welcome. And today we are going to continue looking at the general linear model. Now in the previous couple of lectures we've had a look at what happens when you put categorical predictors into the general linear model and today we're going to ramp it up a bit by looking at what happens when you put categorical predictors or a categorical predictor and a continuous predictor. Does the general linear model explode? We'll find out. Now what we're talking about today sometimes gets taught under the guise of something called analysis of covariance. I tend to avoid that term because analysis of covariance is just a special case of the general linear model. But just so you know, if ever you hear people talking about analysis of covariance, then they are talking about what we are looking at today. We've seen this figure <laughs> probably too many times, um, but just to remind us of how this all fits into the general framework of doing research, you start with a scientific question, you operationalize that question, you sample some data, and then you visualize the data before fitting some kind of model. And at least for the purposes of this module, all the models we fit are variations on the general linear model. Having fit that model, there's a number of things you can do. We can estimate parameters, so uh, these will basically, these are like effect sizes. They tell us the effect a predictor has on the outcome, or they quantify it, I should say. And we can construct interval estimates of those parameters, so confidence intervals around them. And we can also hypothesis test those parameters. So we can see, are those effects, those betas, significantly different from zero? Having fitted our model, always test assumptions and look for the weirdness in the data and if we find any then we can fit a robust version of the model although arguably you should do that anyway so today in particular we're still focusing on this middle section and in fact that's pretty much what we focus on for the rest of this module and like i said we're going to look at a situation uh, that extends what we've looked at in the previous couple of lectures so uh, rather than looking at putting a categorical predictor into the model we're looking at what happens when we uh, also put a continuous variable in. So we've got a mix of categorical predictors and continuous ones. What could be more fun? Who knows? So by the end of this session, hopefully you'd be able to explain how to compare means adjusting for other predictors using the linear model. Um, in other words, you'd know how to fit a linear model with a categorical and a continuous predictor. We're going to have to talk uh, a little bit about different types of sums of squares. So we're going to look at the distinction between type 1 and type 3 sums of squares, which is the funnest conversation you're ever going to have. And we spend a lot of time uh, as well looking at what you get out of the model and interpreting the model and also trying to just bring uh, yeah, the framework that we just talked about, try to bring that in so that you can see that all the things we're doing are really, really similar to every other linear model we've fitted. So we test assumptions in the same way that we have for all the other models we've looked at. And we can fit robust models in the same way that we fitted robust models uh, in previous uh, lectures. So the when and why, well, it's kind of different contexts in which you'd use this kind of linear model. So where you would mix categorical and continuous predictors. Now there's obviously the situation where you're just kind of out in the wild looking at how variables um, kind of uh, correspond with each other and the relationships between them and you might have some naturally occurring variables that involve categories or groups and you might have some naturally occurring variables that you can measure on a continuum so that's one example of where you would mix and match categorical and continuous variables and there's also a sort of experimental research context in which you would do this kind of research design. So this is where you would systematically manipulate groups of people to see the effect of, a, of an independent variable on an outcome, but you want to control for or adjust for extraneous or confounding variables. So you measure something else that you know will affect the outcome and you adjust for it when you look at your experimental manipulation. So in this context, what you're essentially doing is adjusting the means of your groups for these extraneous uh, or confounding variables, so these other variables that you've measured. So in experimental research, which is typically where the phrase analysis, analysis of covariance pops up, um, there's a couple of aims or, uh, that you have when you're trying to measure these confounding or extraneous variables. So one aim is you're trying to reduce the error variance, which is sometimes successful, sometimes not. So you're hoping with any linear model you fit, you're gonna have 
uh, variance in the outcome that's attributable to the model. So that's uh, your model sum of squares that we've talked about before, but also you've still got error in prediction. So unexplained variation, which is uh, quantified with the residual sum of squares. So what you're hoping is if you measure some variables that you know affect the outcome that are not central to your experimental manipulation, then you can reduce this error variance and that will give you a kind of more sensitive measure of your experimental manipulation. So you can kind of use it to try to adjust for known combat, known confounds and uh, to try and uh, re essentially reduce the error in prediction from your model. Um, so let's get to it with an example. So we're going to use one example throughout the entirety of this session and it relates to one of the previous lectures. So there's a clue in the slide which is there's a dog little puppy. So we're going to extend the puppy therapy example that we looked at in the previous couple of lectures. And in those lectures, we had uh, a basic kind of randomized control trial style of design, which is very common in medicine and psychology and therapeutic intervention generally. So we had a control group where people were not exposed to puppy therapy. And then we had two sort of doses of puppy therapy, 15 minutes of puppy therapy versus 30 minutes of puppy therapy. So we've got a three group RCT. So people would be randomized to one of those three arms of the trial. So no puppies, they're the sad people. Um, or sad because they've got no puppies, not sad in a kind of judgmental sense. Um, fifth, those who got 15 minutes were randomly allocated to 15 minutes of puppy therapy and those randomly allocated to 30 minutes. You might also remember if you've watched those lectures that the outcome variable was a happiness measure um, ranging from zero, very, very unhappy to 10, very, very happy. Uh, in true psychology style, <laughs> just measured on a 10 point scale. Um, answers on a postcard as to how valid or meaningful that is. Now, we might think there are other things that could affect the outcome of our therapy. So there may be variables that affect happiness within this context that are, um, you know, could possibly confound the effect that puppy therapy has. And you can think about all sorts of things that might do this. But one example would be how much you actually like puppies because, and whisper this, No! What is wrong with some people? Now, people are going to vary in their natural love of puppies. So some people love a puppy and some people not so keen. So if you're in puppy therapy, and I mean, you might, it's true, you may not put yourself in puppy therapy if you don't like puppies, I don't know, but let's assume, you know, you're randomized, so you, uh, uh, notwithstanding the consent issue, uh, you don't necessarily have a choice, but you think this is gonna, you know, improve your happiness, so, you know, you'll put up with the puppies. Um, if you don't like puppies, having interactions with puppies may not make you as happy as if you love puppy. Now, I love a puppy. Nothing makes me happier than a puppy, apart from maybe a kitten. Kittens make me happy too. Any kind of small animal, apart from a tarantula, that doesn't make me happy. That'd have to be like so small that I can't actually see it to make me happy. But anyway, puppies, they make me happy. So if someone gives me 15 minutes time, quality time with a puppy, my happiness is gonna go up. But if I was the kind of person who didn't like puppies, 15 minutes with a puppy, I mean, kind of at best might make me meh, you know, this hasn't changed my mood at all. If I actively was like frightened of puppies or frightened of dogs, then that would be the equivalent of, you know, me going to like tarantula therapy. That would not make me happy at all. That made me very unhappy. So we might decide to measure love of puppies because we would expect love of puppies to have some kind of uh, effect on whether this treatment actually works. So it should kind of uh, somehow relate to happiness scores. 
uh, in this context. So we measure love of puppies and <laughs> being psychologists, we also measure this on uh, a scale <laughs> that the people just tick from like zero to say seven. So seven, uh, seven being like maximum love of the puppy and zero being, um, <laughs> I was gonna say deeply flawed human being, but I can't say. Uh, zero being, I don't like puppies at all. So let's have a look at the statistical model that we're fitting. Now in previous lectures, where we were just looking at puppy therapy as a predictor of happiness, our model in its simplest form looks like this. We just have an outcome of happiness and we're predicting it from group membership. So which puppy therapy group you are in and there's a parameter attached to that relationship, a beta that we're trying to estimate. However, as we saw when we had more than two groups and uh, in this example, we've got three groups, actually that one predictor ends up being two predictors. So two dummy variables and uh, one of the ways that we can code those two predictors is to have one dummy variable that effectively looks at the long dose of puppy therapy versus the control group and a second dummy variable that looks at the short dose versus the control, uh, the control group, the no puppy group. Essentially, this, this is what we've looked at to date. So three groups get split into two dummy variables. So we have two predictor variables and each one has a parameter attached to it, a beta. Now, when we factor in some other variable, all we're doing is adding another predictor. So in this case, we're adding love of puppies as a covariate or a continuous predictor. And we're including that, we're predicting happiness from that as well as group membership. But basically, we just sling it in the model, we attach a parameter to it that we wanna estimate, the beta three, and you know that's it. So our model just expands to accommodate this extra predictor. So conceptually, it's pretty straightforward. You take the model that you had before and it just expands to incorporate this new predictor. Now, what we're hoping, or what we might be hoping happens here, is that we, by adding that extra predictor, the love of puppies, we can eat in to the unexplained variance. Now, remember that if we're looking at the outcome variable of happiness, there'll be a sort of a total amount of variability in our happiness scores, which we quantify with the total sum of squares. And we've seen in previous lectures that we can partition that into variants that in happiness that can be explained or accounted for by our model or by our predictors. And then there's some error in prediction left over, some unexplained variance in happiness. So variance in happiness that you know is not attributable uh, to our um, puppy therapy groups. So in an ideal world, what we might hope is we get a scenario like this. So the variance in happiness that's explained by the covariate or that can be accounted for by the covariate overlaps exclusively with the error variance. So in other words, we start to get a more sensitive measure of puppy therapy because we're, we're kind of chipping away at the error variance by adding in this new predictor. So in an ideal world, if, uh, you know, if love of puppies was completely independent from which group you were allocated to, you might get a scenario like this, where the, puppy th the love of puppies is eating away at the kind of error variance in the model. <clears throat> However, much more likely you get a scenario like this, where the covariate, the love of puppies, is going to overlap to some extent with both the variability explained by the puppy therapy group and the error variability. So it is not guaranteed that by adding this extra predictor that we're going to kind of get a more sensitive measure of our experimental effect, even though that's what we might hope for. So here's the data. So we've got a variable called dose and a variable called ID. So these are our participants. They've each got a unique code. The variable dose is telling us which dose of puppy therapy they had. So, uh, you know, this first person was in the no puppies group. We've got their happiness score and we've got their love of puppies. So that's what the data looks like. I mean, we uh, can if we so wish, you know, scroll, scroll down the data a bit. You'll see there's a bunch of people in the 15 minute group, a bunch of people in the 30 minute group. And for each of them, we know which group they're in, their happiness score after treatment and uh, their love of puppies. 
Now let's just see what we get out of here if we summarize the data. So first of all, let's look at the mean happiness for the uh, three groups. So now no puppy group, the mean happiness was 3.22. In the 15 minute puppy therapy group, it was 4.88. And in the 30 minute group, 4.85. Now notice in the two puppy therapy groups, those means are really similar to each other. 4.88 and 4.85. It looks, judging from the means, like the dose of puppy therapy is having practically no effect because if we look at those mean scores, they're basically identical. Okay. You know, there are, I mean, given that we've measured it on a, a scale where you can only indicate an, an integer value, a whole number, uh, that, that the difference there is tiny. Um, but both of those groups, uh, the 15 and 30 minute group, have a higher mean than say the control group, the no puppy group. So that's what the means are sort of suggesting. We can see also that this is the uh, the average levels of puppy love in the three groups, and they vary a bit across the groups as well. So uh, in our no puppy group, love of puppies is about three. They, remember, this is just a seven point scale, so that's about halfway along the scale. Uh, it's about three in the 15 minute group. It's a bit lower in the 30 minute group, only comes out of two. Now, we can also look, some of these values are gonna like pop into the lecture later on, so uh, make a mental or physical note of some of them. Um, if we look just overall, if we collapse across all the groups, then the mean happiness score overall, when we ignore which group people belong to, so that's just collapsing across you know, all the participants, mean happiness is 4.37, and the mean love of puppies, 2.73 which is pretty low, I think. I mean, why, you know, why, why would it not be? People should love puppies more than that on average, I would suggest, anyway. Um, so again, just quick mental note of some of those values uh, because we will return to them. But that's a summary of what the data kind of looks like. Oh, this lecture is actually quite interesting. <laughs> Holy kidding, that was Milton's little joke. <laughs> this lecture is just as boring as all the others. <laughs> so let's have a look at the model. As uh, I've already indicated, it's you know it's a linear model. So we've got these uh, dummy variables representing our puppy therapy group, which has been explained in uh, previous lectures. And we're adding this new predictor of puppy love. It's got a parameter attached to it, a beta attached to it, which is gonna tell us about the relationship between puppy love and happiness. That's basically the model that we're looking at. Just a quick reminder of what these long and short variables are. They're just the names that I gave those variables. You could call them whatever you like, but essentially they represent a dummy coding scheme. And just to recap, dummy coding is where you uh, basically code categories with zeros and ones. So you use like a binary coding system. It's sometimes called indicator coding as well. And what you're essentially trying to do is to um, to code group membership across kind of more than one variable using only zeros and ones. So you can see across the groups, the patterns are different. The no puppy groups has a zero, zero pattern across the two variables. Anyone in the 15 minute group has a zero, one pattern, and anyone in the 30 minute group has a one, zero pattern. So the groups are kind of uniquely defined by the pattern of zeros and ones. And literally that column of like zeros and ones uh, for the long variable gets entered as a predictor and same for the one uh, labeled short. So what would you expect to happen? We know what dummy variables represent. We've seen this in a previous lecture. And just to, to, just to remind you that here are the means of the groups. So 3.22 in the no puppy group and 4.8 in both the 15 and 30 minute group, if, you know, rounding off a bit. Um, so what we'd expect to see, based on what we already know about dummy coding, is beta zero, the intercept of the model, should equal the mean of the control group or the reference group. So our beta zero should be the mean of the no puppy group, should be 3.22. The beta attached to the 15 minute dummy variable, the short dummy variable, that should be 
4.88 minus 3.22. It should be the difference between the 15 minute group and the no puppy group. That'd be a value of about 1.66. We also know that the uh, parameter attached to the dummy variable for the long, the long dummy variable is gonna represent the difference between the mean and the 30 minute group and the no puppy group. So that's gonna be a difference of 4.85 minus 3.22, 1.63. So what we'd expect to happen based on what we know about dummy coding from previous lectures, we should see a beta zero 3.22 and beta one and beta two, will, but so the betas attached to the dummy variables will both be about 1.6. So let's see if that's what we get. No, we get something really different. Uh, the parameter estimates, the betas are highlighted in, uh, in yellow in the table. Now we can see from our model, we've put in dose as a predictor, but we have also included puppy love. And the fact we've included puppy love has kind of changed the betas. That's why they're not what we would expect. Now, first off, let's just see how they are similar to uh, betas that we've seen before. And the first, or you know, the main way in which they're similar is we put them in the model in the same way that we would with any other model. So. Uh, our model, which was happiness predicted from the long dummy variable, the short dummy variable, and the puppy love uh, variable. That's, that's still as it is. We can just we can take the betas and we can place them into the model and make predictions about happiness for any other participants based on which therapy group they are in. <laughs> Sorry, I went a bit round the house with that one. Um, so you can see, we can just extract these out, we can put them into the model, we can make predictions about the future. So that's all the same as normal, but their values are not what we were expecting. So why are they not what we were expecting? Well, the reason is because by including puppy love in the model, the betas for dose are being evaluated at kind of average levels of puppy love. So it's no longer the case that they're being evaluated kind of in their raw form, they're being adjusted for the fact that puppy love is in the model. So that's why, for example, for the low dose, the 15 minute dose, rather than the 1.6 we were expecting, which is the difference between the raw group means in the 15 minute group and the uh, control group, we're getting this other value of 1.786. And same for the 30 minute dose, we were again, we were expecting a value of about 1.6, but we get a value of 2.23. And that's because these are now representing uh, kind of the group means adjusted for puppy love. So what do we mean by adjusted for? Well, here we've got the model. It's just from the previous slide. So we've got the long dummy variable, the short dummy variable and puppy love. We've got the betas attached to them. So if we're making predictions about happiness, we can just plug values into this equation and we'll get a kind of a predicted value of happiness. Now, uh, I just wanna remind you of the fact that the average levels of puppy love across all participants were 2.73. So that value is kind of quite important. So first off, let's have a look at what the predicted value of happiness would be in say the control group. So if you're in the control group, if you're in the no puppy therapy group, uh, we've just got the equation at the top here. But what can we get rid of in this equation? Well, we know that in the control group, the long dummy variable is coded with a zero. So we can slash out that long and replace it with a zero. Similarly, on the short dummy variable, anyone in the control group will be given a zero. So we can slash that out because we know it's a zero. So we can get rid of those two things and that's what we do in the line underneath and of course these will cancel because we're multiplying by zero. So we end up with the intercept plus 0.416 which is the beta value for puppy love times puppy love. Now what do we use as the value of puppy love? Well one thing we can use is the average level of puppy love and that's what we do. So on this next line we replace puppy love with the average value of puppy love in the sample, which is 2.73, which carries down to the line below. And we end up with a predicted happiness score of 2.925. So that is basically the predicted value if you're in the control group based on this model. 
we can do something similar for the 15 minute group. So the same equation as before really. But this time, if you're in the 15 minute group, the short dummy variable, you get a score of one, and the long dummy variable, you get a score of zero. So we can again, replace those values in. So on the line below, long gets replaced with zero, that will cancel out. And short gets replaced with one, so 1.786. The beta for short gets multiplied by one, so it retains its value. And again, puppy love, we just can replace it with the average level of puppy love, 2.73, which is what happens down here. So then the predicted value of happiness in the 15 minute group is 1.789 plus 1.786. So it's basically the beta zero plus the beta for the short dummy variable. And then we add to that the beta for puppy love multiplied by the average levels of puppy love. And we get uh, then a, a, a predicted happiness in the 15 minute group of 4.71. And if you're not, if you don't die to boredom already, we can carry this through, of course, to the 30 minute group as well. It's exactly the same procedure here. We've got this, we start off with the same model. We know the long dummy variable is gonna be one for this group. The short dummy variable is gonna be zero for this group. On the line below, we carry that zero down for the short group and that will cancel out to zero. So, uh, and again, we've got puppy love, which we're just gonna replace with the average levels of puppy love, which was 2.73. And then what we're left with is beta zero plus the beta for the long dummy variable, plus again, the beta for puppy love multiplied by the average levels of puppy love. So for the 30 minute group, we end up with a predicted, a predicted level of happiness of 5.15. So by going through this procedure, we've ended up with three predicted values, a predicted value for the control group, predicted value for the 15 minute group, predicted value for anyone in the 30 minute group. So let's have a look at the unadjusted model. So remember here, we don't have puppy love in the model. We're just predicting happiness from these two dummy variables that represent which group, uh, which therapy group someone belonged to. So each dot on this graph is a participant and we've got their happiness scores running up the y-axis and the group membership running across the x-axis. Now in our model, our predicted values are the raw group means. So the predicted value if you're in the no puppy group is 3.22. If you're in the 15 minute puppy therapy group, it's 4.88. If you're in the 30 minute group, your predicted value from the model is 4.85. So the parameters, the betas attached to the dummy variables, which I've called long and short, represent differences between means. So for example, the beta attached to the short dummy variable, beta two, I've labeled it here, is the difference between the means in the 15 minute group and the no puppy group. So between the short group and the control. That's why I called the variable short. And beta one, represents the difference between the mean in the long puppy therapy group and the no puppy therapy group. By adding in another predictor, the predicted values are no longer the raw group means. So as we include puppy love into the equation, into the model, you can see that the predicted values are different from those dashed lines that represent the kind of the raw, the, um, you know, the predicted values before puppy love was entered. So for example, if you're in the puppy, uh, the no puppy condition, your predicted value has gone down. It's now 2.93. So you can see the, the whole line um, is lower down than the dashed line for the no puppy group. And the same is true in the 15 minute group. The predicted value has dropped a little bit. So it's now 4.71. And again, you can see the, the red solid line is below the dashed line. The dashed line represents the the predicted value before puppy love was in the model. But for the 30 minute group, it's gone the other way around. The predicted value has actually increased. So if we evaluate, um, if we evaluate that group at kind of average levels of puppy love, we get a, a, a larger predicted value of 5.15. The betas though, they still kind of represent conceptually the same thing. So beta two still represents the difference between the 15 minute group and the no puppy group but it now represents the difference between these adjusted means. So the means adjusted for puppy love or the means evaluated at average levels of puppy love. And again, beta one still represents the difference between the long therapy group and the no puppy control group. But again, 
it's looking at these adjusted means, the difference between the adjusted means. So this is just to uh, kind of ram this home a bit. So we've got the original means, the unadjusted means for each group. So 3.22, 4.88, 4.85, and the adjusted means which we calculated earlier. And you can see, you know, there are different values. So if we want to work out what beta one and beta two are, we need to look at differences between these adjusted means. So for beta one, which represents the uh, difference between the 30 minute group and the no puppy group, we'd look at the adjusted mean for the 30 minute group, which is 5.51, and subtract from it the adjusted mean for the no puppy group, which is 2.93. This gives us a beta of 2.22. And for beta two, this represents the difference between the no uh, puppy group and the 15 minute group. So we take the predicted value for the 15 minute group, so the adjusted mean of 4.71 and subtract from it uh, the adjusted mean for the no puppy group, which is 2.93, and that gives us a beta of 1.78. So it's the difference between adjusted means. And going back to our table of parameters, those are the values that we saw you know, within rounding error. So the betas change because they now represent the differences between adjusted means of the group. So we're now evaluating puppy therapy at, av at average levels of uh, your love of puppies. Sometimes when I'm walking past a window, I see this beautiful doggy, so pretty. And then I realize, oh, it's me. I'm the pretty doggy, but I tell you what, I was even prettier when I was a puppy. Okay, so that's the model we're fitting, and um, the next thing to think about is we've seen that we can evaluate the fit of a model, and also the overall fit of predictors using something called the F-statistic. And uh, up till now, we've only had to think about the F-statistic in the context of single predictors, m more or less. I mean, we sort of looked at it a bit with multiple predictors earlier on, but on the whole, we've just looked at the F-statistic with single predictors. Now, because we have more than one predictor, we have uh, an extra thing that we need to think about. So the F statistic is calculated using sums of squares. We know this from previous lectures. And actually there are different ways that you can calculate sums of squares. Now, uh, the one way is something known as type one or sequential sums of squares. Now this is the default in R. And so if you do nothing, you will get type one sums of squares. And with type one sums of squares, each predictor in the model is evaluated taking into account previous predictors. So the order that you enter predictors into the model makes a difference to the, uh, to the F statistic or to the sums of squares and therefore the F statistic. So this is not necessarily what you want because with type one sums of squares, it means that you have to think about what order you want predictors to enter the model and uh, you know, there are times when you, you know, that might be a good thing, times when it might not. An alternative is to use something called type three sums of squares. And with type three sums of squares, each predictor is evaluated taking account of all other predictors in the model. So in this context, it's not only previous predictors that are taken account of, it's all predictors. So order doesn't matter. So uh, basically predictors are evaluated, taking into account anything else that's in the model regardless of when it was entered. So this has the benefit that the order that you enter predictors into the model doesn't make any difference. You'll get the same Fs. So typically other things being equal probably use type three sums of squares. There's, you know, people do debate this, but for the purposes of this module, probably just stick to type, well no, definitely stick to type three sums of squares. And just so you know, there are other forms of types of squares like type two and four, which we're not gonna talk about, uh, but they exist. And you can uh, spend a cozy uh, weekend afternoon, if you like, reading up on them. So just to show you what I mean by all of this, here is an example of fitting this model with type one sums of squares. So over here, I've highlighted the fact that we're, we're fitting the model in the standard way in R, predicting happiness from puppy love and dose, and we have entered puppy love into the model first. 
and the table below are the results that we get. And now I'm going to have a look at what happens when we enter the predictors in the opposite order. So over here we've entered dose first and then puppy love. So the models on the left and right they vary only they're exactly the same models they just vary in which order the predictors have been put in. So on the left hand side uh, puppy love has been entered first on the right hand side dose has been entered first and you can see in the tables below that you get different f values and a different profile of results so over here puppy love has an f of 2.2 so when it's entered into the model first its f is 2.2 and it is non-significant so it has a p-value of 0.1 uh, yeah 0.15 when it's entered second so in this model where it's entered after dose it has a different f value of 4.96 and it is significant what about dose so dose when dose is entered after puppy love it has an f of 4.14 and it is significant but when it's entered before puppy love it has a smaller f of 2.77 and that is just about non-significant so basically we've got a scenario where the F's are different for, for both dose and puppy love. They're different in the two models and the significance values are different as well. And that's, you know, again, other things being equal, you probably don't want your F's and your significance values to be dependent on which order you enter variables. Although there are situations where you might want that to be the case, but probably not any situation on this module. So that's what you get with type one sums of squares. And that's probably why we want to try to avoid them, other things being equal. So if you're going to use type 1 sums of squares, and like I said, for the purpose of this module, just don't, um, just bear in mind the variable order matters. It matters which order you enter variables into your model. Type 3 sums of squares, let's do the same kind of uh, exercise and have a look at two versions of the same model. In this version over here, we enter puppy love first and then dose. And in this version over here, we enter dose and then puppy love. So again, we reverse the order. Everything else about these models is exactly the same. But we're now asking to look at the type three sums of squares. And hopefully what should be clear is puppy love, the F value 4.96, it's the same in both models. And for dose 4.14, it's the same in both models. So the Fs and the associated significance values are identical regardless of which order you put the variables in. So as you're going through the tutorial on how to do this in R, there is a kind of extra step that we need to take, which is this step here, to make sure that we're looking at the type three sums of squares. So if you want F statistics, you have several predictors, use type three sums of squares. That's, that's kind of the bottom line for the purposes of this module. There are other things that can influence the F statistic. Um, so if you're using F statistics to evaluate uh, predictors in the model, then we need to assume something called uh, homogeneity of regression slopes. And basically, if this assumption is met, then the F statistic can be assumed to follow the distribution it's supposed to follow and your p-values will be accurate. If the assumption is not met, then the F statistic does not follow the F distribution that it's supposed to and your p-values are inaccurate. This is only relevant for the F statistic. So your significance tests of parameters in the model, uh, this assumption doesn't really matter. But for the F statistic, it does. So what is homogeneity of regression slopes? Well, this is an example. So in this plot, it's an example of homogeneity of regression slopes. And it's to do with the relationship between the covariate or continuous predictor and the outcome. So in this case, the relationship between love of puppies and happiness. And what it's saying is that that relationship should be constant across different the different groups. So across the different uh, doses of puppy therapy, the relationship between love of puppies and happiness should be roughly the same. That's what this plot shows. So for the no puppy group and the 15 minute group, we have homogeneity of regression slopes. The relationship between love of puppies and happiness is basically the same. So the slope of this line here is roughly the same as the slope of that line there. This is the opposite scenario, which is where you've got heterogeneity of regression slopes. And I'm showing you here 
the no puppy group and the 30 minute group. And again, we're looking here at the relationship between love of puppies, the covariate, and happiness, the outcome variable. And hopefully what you can see here is the slope of this line, so the shape of the relationship between love of puppies and happiness is kind of positive and up, you know, pointing upwards in the no puppy group, but in the 30 minute group, the relationship is different. So it's actually slightly negative. So as love of puppies goes up, happiness goes down. So this is heterogeneity, I can't even say it, heterogeneity of regression slopes. So uh, basically, yeah, the relationship between the covariate and the outcome is different across different groups. So for these data, we've got homogeneity regression slopes between the no puppy group and the 15 minute group, but not between those two groups and the 30 minute group. The 30 minute group, uh, the, uh, the relationship between love of puppies and happiness is different to in the other two groups which is bad. So, okay, let's fit the model. Um, so if you're doing this in, in R, uh, follow the, you can follow the tutorials in the Discover package for doing this. But essentially, we can use the LM function and fit a linear model in the, the same way that we normally would. Like I said, we just have this extra step that we have to go through for the F statistics to make sure we're looking at the type three sums of squares. So for this particular model, we see a significant effect of puppy love. So it looks like love of puppies significantly predicts happiness and a significant effect of dose. So it looks like there are differences, significant differences between the adjusted means of um, adjusted mean happiness across the different doses of puppy therapy. So we could say or report dose of puppy therapy had a significant effect on happiness, love of puppies significantly predicted happiness. Just like any linear model, we can have a look at the parameter estimates themselves, have a look at the betas. We've looked at a version of this table already when we were looking at what the betas represented. But now um, we, can, we could also look at the p-values, we could look at the confidence intervals. But we would interpret these in kind of the same way that we've interpreted betas in the past. So for example, for love of puppies, that has a beta of 0.42, and we could say love of puppies significantly predicted happiness. Beta is 0.42, it's got a confidence interval ranging from 0.03 to 0.8, and it's significant. What this is telling us is for every unit increase in puppy love, so as puppy love goes up one on that seven point scale, predicted happiness increased by 0.42 units. So that's 0.42 on that 10 point scale. Um, so, you know, reasonable increase, not massive. If we look at the, uh, the two, so we, we've actually got two effects of dose, because remember we've got these two dummy variables. So dose of puppy therapy also significantly predicted happiness. So both contrasts are significant. Their p-values are less than 0.05. So uh, we know that happiness was significantly higher after both 15 minutes of therapy, a dog therapy, and 30 minutes compared to the uh, no puppy control group. And again, we can directly interpret these betas. So we know, for example, that in the 15 minute dose group, after adjusting for the love of puppies, happiness was basically 1.8 units higher on that 10 point scale uh, in the 15 minute group than in the control. And for the 30 minute group, uh, again, adjust uh, kind of average levels of puppy love, we know that happiness was 2.2 units higher on that 10 point scale than in the no treatment or the no puppy control. So we interpret the betas as kind of raw effect sizes. We can also interpret the p-values uh, in the usual way. We can get R to show us the adjusted mean. So uh, all the calculations earlier on that were sort of illustrating where they come from, you don't have to do any of them. There's a function in R that will just throw out the estimated uh, means for you. So this is just showing you kind of how to do that. Um, and you know, you can interpret these means in the usual way, even though they're adjusted. So you can say average levels of love of puppies, that's fat, that's how we 
explain the fact we're factoring in the love of puppies. Uh, average levels of love of puppies, the mean happiness in the no puppy control group was 2.93, and I've done it, I've, I've quoted its confidence interval as well, compared to a mean of 4.71 in the 15 minute group and 5.15 in the 30 minute group. So we can use these adjusted means to report the results. You know, we all have our strengths and our weaknesses. Now, my owner is very good at tickling my tummy. At being interesting, not so good. What about testing model assumptions then? Well, again, it's, we've just fitted a linear model so we can do it in exactly the same way. We can look at these diagnostic plots that we've looked at before and interpret them in the same way. So we can look at our Cook's distances. We can say, are any of those Cook's distances close to or above one? Doesn't look like there are any. We can have a look at the plots of residuals, so the top two plots to look for uh, heteroscedasticity for example and actually if we look at the plot over I mean basically the the plot here is a bit of a sad story to be honest sad face uh, this blue line or the, the line going through the center of the plot um, ideally should be flat it's not very flat it's going in a kind of upward direction so uh, there definitely seems to be heteroscedasticity here and even looking at the plot on the left where it's sometimes a bit less clear, I think it is pretty clear cut here that you get a sort of, I mean, it's <laughs> friendly, it's just, it's a bit of a weird pattern of results all round, but you don't, you get a sort of diamond shape thing going on here. So you can see again, the flat line down the middle kind of kinks up. So again, lots of kind of uh, indications of heteroscedasticity. So that's something we, we would need to kind of do something about. Normality of residuals, which is much less of an issue anyway, but um, again, doesn't look too great. You can see our dots are snaking quite heavily around the line, but more to the point, we're getting quite big sort of deviations from the line at the extremes. So all in all, probably we'd want to fit some kind of robust model to these data. We could also look at this assumption of homogeneity of regression slopes in a formal way. So you could just look at plots, but we can also refit the model, but asking to look at what's known as an interaction term, which we're going to talk about in the next lecture. Uh, but this is just the kind of um, you know, combined effect of puppy love and dose. So basically, if that interaction, if that combined effect of puppy love and dose is significant, then it means that the relationship between puppy love and happiness is different across the three doses. So it's kind of a formal test of um, heterogene heterogeneity of regression slopes. What we actually have in these data, if you do this test, so looking at this interaction term, it is significant. So for these data, I mean, this is pretty obvious from the plots, to be honest, but if we test it formally like this, you'll see that we can't assume uh, homogeneity of regression slopes. Sometimes this is fine and there are more complex models you can fit that model this variability in uh, the relationship between one variable and another. And that's, uh, you know, that's kind of fine, but we're not fitting those complex models here. So that's why we need to think about this. So the dose by puppy interaction puppy love interaction is significant and what that means is that this assumption is violated and the, the way around that is just to fit more complex models that we don't cover on this module called multi-level models. Let's have a look at a robust parameter estimate. So this is one way to approach a robust model is to use the LMROB function and this um, uses a robust method to estimate the Bs and then the associated significance tests. Now interestingly when we use this approach all of our effects become non-significant. So using a robust model, it looks like there's nothing going on. Puppy therapy doesn't work when you factor in, uh, when you adjust for love of puppies. Notice also with LM Rob, what we're actually doing is getting robust estimates of um, 
the uh, the parameters themselves, and um, they are well for the doses of therapy. They're quite a lot smaller than they were in the non-robust model. So we could say robust estimates show that lover puppies did not have a significant effect on happiness. Uh, we get a value of 0 0.63. That's actually bigger than the uh, non-robust estimate. Uh, for every unit increase in puppy love, predicted happiness increased by 0.63 units. The dose of puppy therapy did not significantly predict happiness based on these robust estimates as well. And again, we can interpret those Bs in the kind of usual way. So basically, happiness was not significantly higher than the uh, control group after 15 minutes or 30 minutes of puppy therapy. Of course, this is not, this is just one way, this is one type of robust model. We can fit another type where we don't re-estimate the parameters, we leave the parameters alone, but what we do is use a robust version of the standard error. Uh, these are known as heteroscedasticity consistent standard errors, and we've talked about them before. So this is an example where we use what's known as an HC4 uh, est estimate of the standard error. And using these, the parameter estimates won't change because we're, we're, not, we're not doing anything with them. We're just using robust estimates of the standard error. So this will affect confidence intervals and significance tests. And using these, everything kind of stays significant. So we've got a very confusing pattern, <laughs> pattern of stuff going on. It's very weird data, basically. So if we just focus on significance tests and making those robust, then lover puppies significantly predicted mean happiness. Um, and it's interpreted in the same way as for the unrobust model because the parameter estimates haven't changed uh, and they won't change using this method. And we could also say that the dose of puppy therapy had a significant effect on happiness as well. So basically we've got completely conflicting results here. I guess the obvious question is what do we do in that scenario? And um, you know, I, the data are really, really messy, and I would probably, in this situation, very small sample size in the data, uh, I would be inclined to uh, believe this model here. So the the one that robustly estimates, um, robustly estimates the parameters. Um, so, you know, I I would personally go with this. So. What we've covered today, when we include both the categorical and continuous predictor, the categorical predictor compares means adjusted for the effect of the continuous predictor. A continuous predictor is sometimes called a covariate. So we're looking at the effect of the categorical variable at average levels of the continuous predictor. If we're looking at overall tests of these predictors using F statistics, we should use type 3 sums of squares so that we don't have to worry about the order that we put variables into the model. We need to test for homogeneity of regression slopes. We can break down the effect of categorical predictors in the usual way using parameter estimates and their associated tests. And you don't have to dummy code. You can uh, use contrast coding, which we covered in a previous lecture as well. And you test the assumptions in the usual way. You apply robust tests in the usual way because all of this is just a linear model. So lots of things are constant here. The way we test assumptions, the way we fit robust models, the way we interpret the Bs, it's all quite consistent. Okay. That's it for now. Thank you very much and I'll see you next time. Bye.